So last week, I took my bucket to the Garden of Eden, and I bring you back <laughs> a little bit of that to spread around. But first, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 91, verse 1 through <coughs> 9. And uh, I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation, but I can quote to you from my heart the first part of it from the King James Version. I love the King James Bible. I think it's great. I just don't happen to speak Elizabethan English. And most people I know don't speak 1611 English language. So I will read later from the New Living Translation, which is a very good translation. It's, it's taken from the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. It's not a version of a version of a version. It's very accurate. Uh, but the King James Version, from my memory, from my heart, is this. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. How'd I do? Pretty good? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a song. That's how I remember it. <laughs> Put it like in a song, it's easy to remember. But anyway, I want to discuss that. You see... Uh, I'm always talking about my grandchildren. Have you noticed that? Anybody notice I talk about my grandchildren? <laughs> being a grandpa is a blast. You know, being a dad sometimes is a real hassle. Because your kids can really be a pain. <laughs> but when your kids have kids, it's really cool because, you know, you can give them back. <laughs> oh, you're so cute. Oh, you need change? Here you go. You know, it's, it, being a grandpa is the best. But, uh... I absolutely, oh, I love my children. Don't get me wrong. They're great, and they turned out great, and I'm very proud of them. My son and my daughter. And uh, my daughter actually saved my life. And then my son stood in for me, and uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful for them. They show their true character, man. When the heat's on, they show it to you. But, but from the garden, this is what I'm getting. God spoke this whole universe into existence, right? Let there be, let there do. You know, and, and, and after all that was done, he knelt <coughs> down on the earth, and with his hands, he formed out of the ground, out of the earth, physical stuff, right? He made a man. And from that man, he made a woman. And he made a special, customized place for them on earth, a physical place called Eden. You know, that place I go to every Sunday to bring you the bucket stuff back from. And that's where he intended us to be. And he intended us to walk together. <clears throat> you know? And I think about when I'm walking around when my kids were little. You know, when I walk around with my grandkids. I just love hanging around them. And while I'm talking with Jehovah's Witnesses, she's clinging to me. And she's, you know, just listening to me talk to them. Share the gospel, defend the gospel. And my little grandson, he's there in my <coughs> shadow, kind of, just listening and, and seeing what's going on. You know, and it reminded me of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. God wanted to walk with us like I walk with my grandchildren today. He wanted to, you know, hold our hands and walk through that paradise with us and hear our little sweet voices and talk to us and answer our questions and say, well, let's eat from that tree. Oh, let's eat from that tree. Let's sit down by the stream here and just spend time with us and fellowship with us. That's why he made us. Now, he knew there'd be a risk. He knew that we could goof up, right? Remember, he said, oh, there's that one tree. It didn't look like a Christmas tree. But he said, don't stay away from that one. You know, he warned us. He knew there was a risk. He knew that we had a will that we could do wrong, but he took that risk, that risk of love. Any of you out there who have ever fallen in love, who ever uh, looked into a girl's or a guy's eyes and said, uh, I love you, there's that pause. Are they going to say, I love you back? Or are they going to say, well, I just want to be friends? Gosh, when I was a teenager, I heard those words so many times. <laughs> that one's sitting right there. Gee, uh, I like you, Tom. You're kind of nice, but I had to wear her down, man. <laughs> took time. Took buying her flowers and stuff like that. But she came around. Thank God. Well, there's that risk of love. I heard somebody say one time that love dances in, in God's hand. 
When, when, when you see someone who's like this, clinging, don't you, do, don't you look at them, don't you go there, don't you, that's not love. That's obsession. That is not love. Where, where were you last night? Why didn't you send me my text back? Why didn't you do this? Well, I called you 15 times and you never returned my call. You were, I saw you standing next to that one guy and you were both laughing. What was up with that? Guys, that is not love. That's not how God is. While we're walking around screwing up, talking out both sides of our mouth, his hand is out and he's saying, Come, come unto me. Come as you are. Don't stay as you are. I welcome you. I hold my hand out to you. And when, I, when, when you come back to me, you will dance in my hand. I will never do this to you. What's wrong with you? What's up with you? Will you? Yeah, that's the way we get sometimes. You will say, welcome home. Now I want to show you my paradise, my garden, and I want to walk with you for eternity, and you'll never shed another tear. You'll be with me forever, and I'm going to take care of you. And, when, and as your family comes along, we're all going to gather. One day, I'm going to dance before the throne of God. I'll learn a few steps before that, hopefully. Me, my wife, my kids, even Mackenzie and DJ, and I'll invite the rest of you. And we're all going to dance before the throne of God forever. And when we're done dancing, we'll go eat a feast somewhere. We'll go sing a great song somewhere. And we'll come back and do it again. And we'll never get old. We'll never get tired. We'll never stub our toe. That's my eternity. That's my future. And that's what he always intended. That's what it was like in the Garden of Eden. They were perfect. They were sinless. And they lived in the shadow of the Almighty. All right. All that in mind, that was God's original will for us. And we blew it. And he sent Jesus to bring us home. That's the gospel, guys. And I'll keep saying that until the cows come home. But let me read to you now from the New Living Translation. Psalm 91, 1 through 9. Now check this out. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you sorry, from deadly diseases. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. So don't be afraid of the terrors of night, nor the arrows that fly by the day, nor the Iranian terrorists who threaten to blow us up every other day. Don't fear them either. Do not dread the disease that stalks you in the darkness, or the brain tumors that you get to report. Just adding that. <laughs> nor the disaster that strikes at midday. A lot of wind last night. Blew some shingles in my yard from I don't know whose roof. Verse 7, though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying all around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punishment. Now here's the, the climax here of what I want to say. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, oh, right, I'll throw verse 10 in because I love you. No evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your dwelling. I'll stop right there. Guys, nothing is going to conquer you. You'll go through stuff. You'll hear bad news. I don't even turn the TV on anymore. I'm tired of bad news. I'd rather go to my knees and pray. But uh, it will never conquer you. It'll upset you. It'll hurt you. It'll sting you. It might, you know, hurt, I mean, stub your toe or put your eye out or something, and it stinks, and it's upsetting. Gosh, yeah, but it will never conquer you. That is the message. Evil will not conquer you. You don't need to be afraid of it. You can hate evil. Please do. God hates evil. God hates sin. But, hey, guess what, guys? God loves sinners. Of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul said he was, but not. Nah, he never met me. <laughs> okay? God loves sinners. 
God wants us back. I know I keep telling you that, but it's the first message I got from the garden. He loves you. He wants you back. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. You can say, oh, oh I'm, a, I'm a pornographer, or I'm a homosexual, or I'm a transvestite. I'm sorry to hear that, but God still loves you. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Let him wash you. Let him cleanse you. Yeah, I love these people. I love those Jehovah Witnesses that showed up at my daughter's door. I had no hate for them. But I don't want them to stay Jehovah's Witnesses because that's messed up. I said, that organization is lying to you. Look it up, man, the age of information. Back it up. How many hundred times would they give you a false prophecy? And the Bible clearly says, if someone gives a false prophecy, don't listen to them. That's in Deuteronomy. It's either 18 or 28. Probably 18. Please check me out on that. I'm not good with the math. You know that. I love scripture, but I need help with math. That's why I'm very bored. Anyway, we're back to verse 1. I get, I get off. Do you notice that? Ever since they removed that thing from my brain, I, I, just, I just go off on stuff. God wants to walk with you. All right? I already established that. He wants to hold your hand. He wants to hear your sweet voice. Just like me and my grandkids. Or maybe you have little ones around you. Or maybe you just love your kids right now at the age they're at. And you want to do that with them. He loves their, their being around them. He wants to hear how their day was. What's going on with you? You know, are you, did, did that boy across the table, did he look at you? Did he wink at you? Did he buy you a present? How nice, how sweet, how wonderful. But not that guy with the tattoos and the foul mouth. Don't let you sit with it. <laughs> anyway, tattoos are awesome. <laughs> Those who do walk with him, it's not a sermon, tattoos. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, I'm being recorded. Hi. <laughs> Speaking of that, the last time I checked, my testimony that I gave two weeks ago has received 370 plus views. I was sitting in, in, in my recovery state in my basement, and the Lord says, record your story. Tell people your story. And that story brings God glory. That story is not a reflection of how smart or how spiritual I am. No, no. It's how good God is. He was to this bozo from shooting, and he wants to do the same for you. He wants to lift you up. That's the story. 370 views. Thanks to the Haney family for running the camera for me. I really appreciate it. And to Sam for putting it out there. It's, it's a blessing. And I've had many of my family members uh, watch it. You know, from New Jersey to Georgia to all around. Just talked to a guy yesterday who lives in Idaho. He's watching it right now, probably. <laughs> and he's going to watch this. How you doing, Scott? <laughs> so it's pretty awesome what God does, you know, through a bozo from Chewton. And I'm admitting it. I'm happy to be God's bozo. You, know, you, ever hear that? you ever heard that expression, he may be an idiot, but he's my idiot. Ever heard that before? I think that's awesome. Dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, <laughs> walking with him in his shadow. Like, like my little grandson was, was in my shadow while I was talking to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Just looking up at me and says, Wow, he's talking about Jesus. I want him to grow up with that memory. Grandpa, he, he wasn't afraid to share the gospel. Uh, last week, uh, we went up to Cook's Forest and we did a wedding. And uh, they paid our way and everything, and uh, we're up there in this beautiful uh, resort. And there was a lady there during the rehearsal dinner who had one of those chairs, those chair, massage chair things. You put your face in the half donut, and, they, and it was a free massage, kind of commercial, where you can make an appointment later and pay the price, and she can make some money. And it was a free massage. I'm like, me, cut me in, I'm in. So I, uh, I sit down in the chair, and I took my glasses off, and I said, hey, I've just recently had surgery, because she was staring at my head. Which is healed up quite a bit, by the way. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, uh, it was just a little bit of a, of, of a scar there at that time. And she goes, oh, really? What happened? And I said, well, I, I had a brain tumor. But the Lord guided me through it. And he's really taking great care of me. And it was only barely a month ago. And it's healing up really nice. And the, I'm really thankful for God because the Lord has given me a second chance. So here I am witnessing to a masseuse. 
<laughs> out, of, out of Thanksgiving. And uh, she goes, really? Because I got these symptoms and stuff, and I have to go uh, you know, see a doctor. And I said, well, <coughs> well, let me pray with you. And she looked at me and said, what? I said, give me your hand, let's pray. She gave me her name, and there I am praying in the middle of a rehearsal dinner in a lodge at Cook's Forest for this person. I'm like, God has really given me a new heart. He's really doing things in me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm proud of Jesus, and I'm always pointing towards him, and he's taking away my shame. You know, he can do it. So that's an honor and a privilege. I'm not, I'm not bragging about that. But uh, I want my grandkids to live in, the, in my shadow and see that, hey, Grandpa is not ashamed to preach the gospel. I want that to be something that sticks with them all of their lives. And that's what I, when I read Dwelling in the Shadow of the Most High, I think of them. You know, most, most religion, it drives the God right out of you. Religion sometimes is like a big, ugly club. Hey, how you doing today? Don't do this. Don't look at that. Don't listen to that music. Don't go see that movie. What are you wearing? What are you? It's just, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It's just like, it's a guilt trip. You guys ever feel that about religion? And you wake up in the morning, and you're like, well, I don't feel very godly today. I don't feel very this. So I might as well not even go to church. So I might as well not even open my Bible. Boy, that is rampant in the United States of America. Guilt, shame, guilt and shame. God is not about that kind of religion. The Bible tells us that true religion is helping other people out. Widows and orphans and your neighbor. You know, if Ellen was my neighbor, right? She's a famous lesbian, <laughs> right? But she is a sweetheart. She's nice. If she was my next door neighbor, I would shovel her driveway I would help her in with her groceries. I would sit on her porch with her and drink tea with her while she told me jokes and made me laugh. I would. But when it comes down to the, the issue, you know, the issue, I'd say, Ellen, the Bible says this. And it has always said this. And I love you and I want you to go to Jesus and get yourself straightened out. I was a sinner, too. I had different kinds of sins, but I brought it to the cross. And the Lord fixed me up. And He hooked me up. And I have an eternity. And I have a peace. You know? I've heard these statistics. Maybe you've heard them, too. The suicide rate among homosexuals is off the charts. As a people group, their suicide rate is high. Because they just never find true peace. Now, they may have legal rights, they may have approval from this group or that group, they may want to charge on, but when it all comes down to it, they never have peace with God. Because that's not the way God made us. And He has always said so. I'm just reporting. Not because I hate you, not because I'm judging you, because I don't want you to falter or fall. I want you to be able to walk in that garden holding God's hand with me, and the foamers and everybody else who's up here, you know, enjoying you, God forever. Ellen, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to commit suicide. Do you get my point on that? This is the heart that God has given me. I'm not here to throw stones at people and put them down, even though I disagree with them. Even though the Bible's clear that that's a sin. And the whole media thing is saying, oh, you narrow-minded, stupid Christians putting people down, judging people. You're what's driving them to suicide. You're putting a guilt trip on them. God forbid. I don't want to put a guilt trip on any of them. I want them to know the love of God that saved me from my sin. You get that. You understand that. So walking with God, walking in His shadow, walking in His joy, that's our goal. That's sharing the gospel. It's not like... Tom, did you talk about Jesus today? Well, no. Oh, you should feel really guilty. You should feel really bad. That's not the voice of God, people. Just keep pointing upward. Reflect upward. Hey, how you doing today? I'm fine. God is good. Oh, yeah? Why do you say God is good? Well, he sent Jesus for me, and he died for my sins, and one day I will be with him. I'll, I'll be able to look into his eyes. I'll be able to give him a hug. I'll be able to walk through the garden with him. That's good news. People don't hear that. Am I right? That's the message. That's how you witness. 
Or maybe you're not feeling articulate like you, what you can talk about. Well, uh, I follow Jesus, and if you want to know more about that, there's this really weird guy from Chewton that got a scar on his head in, in Elport. You're welcome to come with me next Sunday. And he's got a mouthful of stuff to tell you. You can try that. <laughs> but uh, that's sharing the gospel. There's no guilt. There's no shame in that. That's, that's reaching out to a dark, lost world. Do you agree? I mean, let's, let's just take a moment and look at the world around us. Have you heard how many map, what do call it, disasters that have happened in our world lately? There was a big uh, a volcano eruption. Was it in the Philippines? Down south was a terrible storm, a rash of uh, terrible high winds and tornadoes and whatnot. And shingles missing from my neighbor's houses. And, and crazy, weird stuff going on. And you've heard what's going on in Iran. They get up every morning and chant, death to America, death to Israel. And Donald Trump says, oh yeah. <laughs> Whether you like Donald Trump or not, he's a scary fella. He's got his finger like this on the button. Don't you mess with him. Anyway, pray for him. But uh, this world is going nuts. Isn't it? There is hatred. I've never seen hatred like today. I've, I've met more people in my lifetime who, were, who say they're atheists. Not agnostics. Or not, I'm not sure about this or that. They just go right to the atheist word, word which is a heavy, heavy statement. And I, I, I really believe, guys, that they're not atheists. They have been turned off by people carrying that big, ugly club called religion. Lousy, no good sinner. You did this, you said that, you voted this way, you listened to that music, and you know, and I'm like, yeah, I ain't going to that church. Yeah, that Jesus must be a real, you know, tough guy. I'm not going there. And, and, and they're so turned off. I'm not saying compromise. I'm not saying sell it short. Yeah, God has rules. Yeah, God has this thing called the law. He does say, thou shalt not kill which is murder. He says, thou shalt not commit adultery, which is pornography in a sense, which is going too far at the office with this one or that one, or looking too long at this or that, which Jesus has brought out. Yeah, he says not to do stuff, but he says it because he loves you. And you have any little ones? Hey, sweetheart, that's a busy intersection. Don't just run out there. Don't just play out there. You could get hit. Why do we tell our little ones that? Because we love them. We don't want them to get run over or hit or injured. Look both ways before you cross the street. That's the law. Why do we say that? Because we want them to be okay. That's why. And the kids, they, they pick that up. Yeah, you know, mom and dad are throwing just a guilt trip on me. They're, they love me. They don't want me... And in order they get there, realize, oh, thanks, Mom, thanks, Dad, I appreciate that. But uh, anyway, this world is going nuts. And we as Christians, if we're investing heavily in this world system, if we're trying to build something within this world system, we're going to be let down and disappointed and burned out. That is why Jesus and, and the disciples constantly say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Be in the world, but not of this world. Lay not your treasures here, but lay your treasures in heaven. And on and on and on. Yeah, we live here. Yeah, we're like salt sprinkled around. You know, salt, it melts the ice. It adds flavor. It gives us preservative. Before there was refrigerators, there was salt. You rub that on the meat, it creates like a coating that keeps the, the corruption, the, the, the rotting process, slows it down. And I honestly think, guys, we are here in this earth, even though it's unpleasant, but we are slowing down the rotting process. At your, at your workplace, he has, he has sprinkled a few Christians here like, why am I here, Lord? I hate this job. These people are rough around the edges, man. They talk, they, they use this language. You have been put there by the Lord for a time, maybe not forever, maybe a year, maybe a month, who knows, but you were put here for a time as a preservative, as an ice melter, as a witness, right? For a time, such as this. 
And then you, you'll know, move you on to something else down the road. But one day, guys, <clears throat> Jesus is going to clear his throat. He's going to lean over to Gabriel and say, blow that horn, call my bride home. I want to see her. I've built a place for her. That's John 14. You can check it out for yourself. And, that, and we're going to live in his shelter and physically see him and be with him forever. What a day that will be. I look forward to that. He is a rescuer. If you read through these uh, verses in Psalm 91, he is a preserver, he is a protector, and a rescuer. How do you know that, Tom? You're looking at someone who got rescued. You're looking at someone who just very recently got a very bad report from a doctor. The first doctor that we talked to showed, showed us, he just looked at the x-ray, they took a picture of my cranium here, and, and what their first report was, you got a tumor on one side, and on the other side of your brain, there's cancer floating around. That was their report. And then they went on to say something like, well, he may have quality of life for another three years. Is that good news? That's what they said. So, I got rescued from that, guys. I'm telling you. I'm standing here before you. And I won't be standing here for a few more Sundays until the Lord comes back or until whatever. But I'm standing here because of Jesus, guys. First, he woke up my daughter and says, talk to your dad. He's got <laughs> something going on in that cranium of his and he's dealt with. And he's not about to get checked out because he's got a hard head. So you talk to him. And that happened. And then we got that report. It turns out that report wasn't entirely true. They ambulated me. That means I got into an ambulance. And they took me by ambulance to LEA General. They took another picture and they said, well, we see the tumor, but we don't see no cancer around. So that was a fuzzy picture or, or whatever was wrong. So there we are. Not everything you hear is the truth. Every scary thing you hear or every scary thing you live in the shadow, maybe some shining the light of truth on that will disperse some of that. But, okay, the reality was, Tom did have this thing on his cranium, and it was a tumor. we got to go in. So a few days later, I was under the knife, right? The whole time I'm going through this, personally, God has given me a peace and a comfort. And I really want to share that with you guys. God does not deal in the fear department. God does not deal with us in the anxiety department. God does not deal with us in the guilt and the shame and the condemnation department. None of those things are from God. I'm telling you from the scriptures. I'm telling you from personal experience. If you're feeling condemned or guilty or something like that, okay, repent for your part. But God is in the restoration business. And God is in the rescue business. The whole time, God is telling me in my heart, it's going to be okay, son. I got you. I'm going to get you through this surgery. Don't be afraid. Guys, listen for that voice. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of God. He is loving and caring. I got you, man. I'm with you. I'm going to get you through this. Trust in that voice. I'm telling you from first-hand experience. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear brings torment. You know? Other people have said, fear is a mind killer. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is messed up, and it messes you up. Now, well, the fear and respect of God, I understand that. That's different. But just living in fear and in dread, that is not God. When God sees you in trouble, in trouble he is, it goes into rescue mode. Now, I think I said two weeks ago, I, I find that God very seldom takes you out of something that he usually takes you through it. And when, when you get to the other side, with God, not by your own works or your own so-called cleverness, but when you go through something and get to the other side with God, you got a testimony. you got a story to tell to God's glory. You take that test and you turn it into a testimony by sticking with God. You know what? I, I went through this battle, man. I went through this time of testing and trial. And 
I went through this doctor's thing where everything looked negative, and I totally gave it to God. I took God's hand. He got me through the other side, and now i got a testimony. And here's the microphone, guys. <laughs> it's waiting for those testimonies. So, he's in the rescuing. He's in the protecting thing. You know, I'm, I'm a law-abiding citizen. You know, I pretty much haven't been in jail ever, I don't think. One night I was drinking and I was underage. They took me to the station and called my dad, who wasn't home. And my brother came and picked me up and I got a slap in the hand. But, you know, that's as far as my legal troubles go. I've since repented of my sins and given my heart to Jesus. And I haven't been arrested since. <laughs> Taken to the station since. Yes, it happens. So I'm sorry if you never heard that story before. But I, I'm clean. I'm a different man now. <laughs> okay. He forgives me. <laughs> this is good. But God is a protector. And, and I'm a law-abiding citizen. But uh, one day I thought somebody uh, did wrong to my daughter. And I hunted them down. And I chased them down. And I forcefully brought them back to my house. And I made them apologize to her. He was just a little kid. He was scared out of his mind. He was shaking like a leaf. If he had went home and got his lawyer or his, or his mom or his dad, I could have been in jail. Right? But I went into protection mode. Nobody messes with my daughter. Mm -mm. Nobody throws her in the mud. No, mm -mm. Nobody calls her names or makes her cry. Uh-uh. Right? One day I went to the movies with my son. Right? And there was a kid, there was a bunch of kids that were picking on him, calling him names in school. And he was, he was brave about it. And he got through it. And he didn't respond in kind or get into trouble. But it was upsetting. It was hard. So he, he shows me this one kid at the movies who was a couple people in front of us in line waiting to get in. He goes, oh yeah, that's, Dad, that's one of the kids that, uh, that was picking on me. I said, really? And I gave him the death glare. Like, <laughs> I can kill you. You upset my son. I, I need him the stink eye, man. <laughs> and it got to the point where, like, he was like, he'd look back, and I'd still be staring at him, right? And the, and the movie was over, and we were walking in line. We we're all like cattle heading towards the exit. And uh, one time, this kid turned around and looked, and there I was again, staring at him. <laughs> right? And he's like, he turned around real quick, and he's trembling. He messed with my son, man. He upset my son. I could have went to jail, man. Somebody could have got a lawyer and said, this guy was intimidating my son. But thank God it didn't happen. But anyway, I went into protection mode. I'm going to protect my kids. I walk out of the movie theater, my son and I are walking this way, and this kid was walking this way to his car. He looked back one more time, and yes, I was there, giving him the death glare. You fine Christian man, you. Sorry, went into protection mode. Don't mess with my kids. I think God has the same attitude. Yeah, you pick on my kids. Yeah, you want to do this to my, my people, my church, my bride. Yeah, you mess with them for a while, but I ultimately will have the final say. Don't mess with my kids. I go into protection mode too. Yeah, God's merciful, but the hammer's going to fall one day, guys. Have mercy on those who picked on his kids. It'd be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck than to mess with one of my little ones. Didn't Jesus say something like that? So, this is saying, it's all 91. He is our protector. He covers you with his wings, or with the feathers, like, like a mother hen would protect her chicks from, from whatever, from the chicken hawk flying over or whatever. But uh, I'll, I'll just close with this. God absolutely adores you. He loves you. If there's sin in your life, or if there's guilt in your life, or if there's fear in your life, he can help you through it. And he is not the source of it. He may, he may convict you. Have you ever heard feel that ping if you're, as a Christian? Gosh, I used to swear a lot <laughs> when I was a kid. I had a foul mouth. Sorry to tell you that. But uh, when I became a Christian, I started swearing less and less and less. Because every time I did, that little ping 
went off in my heart like, oh son, don't talk like that. Oh, don't, don't use this kind of, that kind of language anymore. And I'm not saying I'm sinless in that department. I'm not saying I don't slip up occasionally. I'm not throwing stones. But I have learned. And that's how he taught me through conviction. Gosh, you can do better than that. I love you, son. Don't use that language. Guilt trip is like, you worthy, no good. Here's the lightning bolt coming right at you. That's the way the Greek gods were. That's the way that big ugly club is of religion. Aha! You said a bad word. Boom! You know, that's not God. God loves you. He wants to help you through your sins. He wants to help you out of your trouble. He wants to bring you back to his garden like you were supposed to be in the first place. He wants you to walk in a shadow. He wants to hear your sweet voice like Tom and his grandchildren talking to the Jehovah Witnesses on the front door. He wants that relationship back. And through all this trouble and trial and desolation that we're going through in this world where there's hate and there's anger and there's natural disasters and there's floods and hurricanes and volcanoes erupting, he's saying, these are the birth pangs. This is the, was, the dilation has started. I heard, I heard a uh, gynecologist say, once the dilation starts, it never stops until the baby's born. I think we're underway. I think the time is coming when the Lord is coming back. I don't know the day or the hour. And I never will say that because Jesus said no man knows that. But one day, the Lord's going to tap him on the shoulder and say, go get him, boy. Bring him home. I'm ready for that. How about you? So let me pray for you. Um, actually, I'm going to call up Eric. Would you come up here and uh, pray for our service? And please come over and eat with us after the service. We're having food over there. And I am going to be at the back door. I want to shake each and every one of your hands and wish you a good day. And then I'll see you over there. So, Eric. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for for today, in this service, God, I pray Lord, that we just take these words and put them in our hearts. I pray, God, that they're planted like seeds. I pray, God, that you just water them and that we leave here today knowing that we are loved and that we are valued and that we are your children. I pray, God, that you just keep us all safe, that you give us strength, and that we don't leave this place feeling weary and battered and, and weak. That we leave here feeling strong and courageous. I pray, Father, you just break those chains of fear and, and break those chains of, chains of um, shame and guilt, Lord. You have taken all of that away from us. And we just thank you and we praise you for that. I pray, God, as we eat, that we just enjoy each other's company, that we have fun, that we encourage each other, and we become a family. We are your children, we are your church, and we love you, and we praise you, and we worship you. And I pray, God, that you just get glory from us in our everyday lives, Lord. And we just thank you again for our weeks, that you bring us back next week, and you just keep speaking to our pastor, and that we just keep growing, Lord. And we just thank you, and we praise you again in Jesus' precious name.